Okay, yeah, so the book's called Moonwalking with Einstein, uh, and it's written by a young fellow, Joshua Foyer. Uh, it's about human memory and improving human memory. Uh, now, rather than go chapter and verse through the book, uh, I'm just going to isolate most of the themes that I can uh, and talk to them specifically. So the first one is the author's journey, which is a really interesting narrative right through the book. Uh, a second theme is what is memory, so a little bit of an explanation about how memory works and some of the types of memory. Another theme being how to improve your memory, and in particular why I found it attractive to have a look at this book, uh, some techniques that you might be able to use on a daily basis to improve your memory. A very, very brief, possibly the worst history lesson you'll sit through, History of the Art of Memory. Why memory is important, uh, apart from the bloomin' obvious, uh, there are some other ideas there that I think you find uh, semi-interesting. And the author also gets interested in expertise and how to develop expertise through his journey. Speaking of which, okay, so the author's journey, uh, as I said, a uh, fairly young fellow, but he, he did ask the question as to how improved his life would be if he had a better memory, and I think we can all kind of empathise with that comment or thought that we could probably do a lot of tasks much better if our memory was vastly improved. So, you know, this is what kind of was the catalyst for him to investigate improving his memory. Uh, and ultimately this is what the book's about, it's the year he spent trying to improve his memory uh, and the things that he learnt along the way about how memory works uh, and some of the things that we do well and some of the things we don't do so well and how to uh, use techniques to improve his memory. One point that's important to mention and I should have done it earlier, he's a journalist, he's not a expert or a PhD student or the like so you know you kind of get a great little view of uh, a perspective from from a journalist as opposed to an expert in the field. Now, spoiler alert, if you use movie parlance, uh, he ultimately learned that you can improve your memory and you can become an expert in nearly any field if you apply certain principles. So these are the things that he's kind of learned throughout that journey, plus some other things, and we'll touch over those. But that's where he was going with this. And one of the really interesting parts is that he committed to entering the US Memory Championship. So he was going to train up for, I think, nearly a year and then enter and see how he goes, to so see whether he could actually improve his memory. And we'll come back to how he went there. Uh, but ultimately, it makes this book very interesting indeed. What is memory? Uh, this is not a medical book by any stretch, um, so really he just covers off this very lightly. Uh, you know, we could say that fundamentally at a physiological level, memory is just a pattern of neurons in the brain. Uh, he, we don't go into too much more detail other than they kind of exist in the brain, that you can't really see them, uh, but they certainly are there. And the study of memory has been uh, fairly constant in the last uh, century or so as to how we best use it. Types of memory. Uh, implicit and explicit memories. Implicit is like riding a bike, you don't really access it directly. Explicit memories are, involve complex changes in the brain and explicit memories are the ones we have as a child, the ones we have that we did yesterday. And the funny thing about explicit memories is that they kind of go through a life cycle so that the older the memory, they kind of turn into a movie or a third person, whereas the memory that you had yesterday is first person, as if you're doing it. It seems to be that they almost kind of become, you turn episodes into facts and it's it's a really interesting little idea, and it's I found that uh, something that intrigued me. And Sigmund Freud, I think, first documented that process where the memory goes through a life cycle. Implicit memories are off limits to the conscious brain. Uh, so, as I said, riding a bike, you don't actually seem to access them directly. They bypass the short-term memory buffer and and don't go via the hippocampal region, which manages most of the other memory. So. Um, they're really interesting because you can't really tap into them but the point in the book is made um, that the majority of your personality seems to be formed by implicit memories uh, I don't know how they came about with that I think it's a statement that probably hangs there a little but nonetheless the implicit memories are ones you can't really tap into so much another comment being that dreams seem to take a role in memory it seems to be that when you have dreams they might be crystallizing those into into memories if you will at night uh, or when you're dreaming uh, retrieval is also an interesting concept because, you know, the brain, although it's a huge super functioning uh, organ, seems non, it's non-linear associative nature it means that you can't orderly search your brain. You can't make it uh, uh, possible to go through and say, okay, I'm going to orderly consciously search for that memory. It seems to just kind of hop around. So when you get one idea, um, you kind of have to find another idea, uh, which seems fairly inefficient, but nonetheless that's how the retrieval of the brain works for memories. Uh, another comment made when they were looking at memory champions is say well are they using different parts of the brain and is their memory being used uh, how are they coming about 
getting, uh, you know, performing those memory feats of theirs. Well, the scan showed that yes, the memories uh, that they're accessing seem to be using different sides of the brain, in particular perhaps the right hand side, which are more visual, um, the more visual side, the more spatial side. And we'll talk a little bit about that improving your memory because that's kind of self evident now that when you improve your memory, you'll be using those areas of the brain more. So they don't have uh, memory chambers don't have better me average memory, but they are able to access different things, uh, use different parts of their brain. Sorry. Also, another point made is that we may have a little ray man inside our head. If you were to damage your left hand side, perhaps fire a herpes simplex virus or some other. Uh, you know, damage uh, your right hand side, if it plays a bigger role, you could potentially demonstrate savant like ability, i.e., counting the number of toothpicks that fall on the floor and it automatically. Um, yeah, I'm tongue in cheek there, but ultimately it shows that spontaneously you can actually have a damage to your brain and you can all of a sudden have these kind of savant like abilities, which, you know, begs the question do we have innate? potential in our brain that we can't access and it would suggest that yes this does occur uh, and can occur um, and I think that ultimately we start to question whether we can tap into that on a regular basis as opposed to just having to wait for someone to smash in the left hand side of the brain. Okay, as I alluded to this is going to be a very short memory uh, history lesson. Uh, ultimately memory was the root of all culture. You can imagine there's no really externalized memories. Um, the father of the art of memory is recognised this guy, Simondes, uh, happened in BC sometime. He was at a banquet hall, it collapsed, the ceiling collapsed, they all kind of scurried out. And uh, this father of the art of memory, if you will, kind of reconstituted or re-enacted in his mind where people were sitting through the, in the banquet and was able to determine who was in the banquet hall and who wasn't and was able to expedite you know, the rescue effort and determine who's missing and who's not. So this is the first kind of documentation I would suggest of using a technique to, to help with memory. This technique plus others were kind of codified in um, I think 82 BC uh, in, in, a, in a scripture called I guess Latin ad hirium. it's not Arabic so I just threw that in there for effect but uh, there's a scripture there and this kind of documented major memory techniques uh, which we're going to talk about in in, in a minute uh, and uh, memory champions are still using these techniques now so we move from no really externalized memories into the era of books and indexes and externalized memory so outside of the brain and yeah <laughs> You know, it, there was a question about whether this is the end of remembering. Uh, if I can jump around a little bit, you know, Socrates, the guy, the fat guy with sandals that seems to kick around in all the town squares with big eyebrows, I see him, big eyebrows. Yeah, he he was a little concerned about it all. Uh, there's an irony here in that I wouldn't know anything about Socrates if we hadn't written anything about him, but he was a little concerned about the the externalised memory or writing down things, and he thought that it was a recipe for um, remembering as opposed to real learning. Uh, and discovery uh, and so he felt that there was going to be this movement where a lot of people would look like they know a lot but potentially know next to nothing uh, there might be something to that but he was a little concerned about it all and I think that ultimately in the contemporary side of things if I can move over you know the the current thinking is it's yeah we might have lost our way a little because of reliance on externalized memory books hard drives all those type of things uh, and so I wouldn't say there's a resurgence but there's a growing awareness of it in the in the modern day as to the role that memory plays in the human condition uh, one of the fellows that's on kind of takes a leading role is this British educator by the name of Tony Bussan uh, let me draw him here there's a top hat cane and fog watch and monocle. Yeah, so this fellow has written over 200 titles on improving your memory. I think he even painted the mind maps. Uh, I think his driver made some kind of comment that uh, the 200 titles on memory are all like the same meal, but there's just different gravy here. So he's making a lot of money of it out of the out of the industry. Uh, but there's a growing awareness and obviously a growing need for his kind of books. And he's he's made the mention that he's really concerned about Western education being corrupted by the rote learning principles rather than using techniques. And so he's really ad advancing the idea that we must teach our kids first how to learn then teach them what to learn you know so we're missing that first part and going straight to teaching them what to learn he's concerned about that and and just generally a little concerned about the fact that society is not spending as much time uh, and effort in trying to learn things uh, and you know that we're furnishing our houses more than we're furnishing our brains so this general movement towards you know trying to use techniques and other things to to better ourselves Okay, so that's the end of part one. Uh, part two awaits.